Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 6th of June as always. We have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. I dived into the next generation of the Azure data box. So they actually sent me one of these units so I could see the setup experience, actually use the thing. And it, it's amazing how intuitive and easy to use it is. So this is that offline data migration solution where I can't either move my data into or out of Azure online over the network. So instead I basically get this unit shipped to me and I copy the data to it and it then goes and gets imported. So I walk through the entire process, the encryption, how it's scrubbed at the end, so you can be more familiar on how you might want to use it in your environment. So on to what's new. So Azure Container Apps now supports Azure Files NFS. So Azure Files initially was SMB for that file-based protocol, but it also supports NFS shares. So now if I am using an Azure Files NFS share, well, I can make it available and mount it from my Azure Container Apps. And why that's really useful is with a file-based protocol, it's very easy to have multiple different containers connecting to the same share, so it gives me the ability to have shared storage. So it's really nice to now be able to use that. On the storage side, so Azure Storage Mover Solution can now move from your SMB file shares, wherever they may be on premises, wherever, to Azure Blob containers. So previously you could move NFS shares to Blob and you could move SMB shares to Azure files only. So now I get this additional flexibility that I can take a content and SMB share, for example, in a Windows server on-prem and now actually migrate it into Azure Blob. On the database side, so the Postgres SQL flexible major version upgrade is in preview. So this is an in-place major version upgrade from version 11 through to 16, all the way up to 17. So it's in place, so I don't have to change the server endpoint, because I'm not changing the server endpoint, it means no app reconfiguration, there's no manual data migration, and I can do this from the portal, I can do it from the CLI to kick off that. And one of the nice things now is I don't have to drop any kind of logical replication, any kind of HA. It will deal with that automatically for me. Now, it doesn't mean I shouldn't test the thing. It would be recommended to get a clone of your production server, perform an in-place upgrade of that, make sure there's no issues, and then sure, you can go ahead and schedule that in-place migration. Upsert and script activities are now available in the Microsoft Fabric Data Factory uh, think of the pipelines for PostgreSQL flexible databases in GA. So remember, if I think of Data Factory within Microsoft Fabric, it's a data pipeline. That data pipeline lets me perform various types of activities on my data. I can transform the data, I can move the data into different locations. If I think extract, transform, load, or extract, load, transform, they're all things I do in a data pipeline. They're all things I would do in data factory. So now what we can do with the PostgreSQL is upsert. So upsert merges the idea of doing both uh, an insert or an update. So if the record doesn't exist, it will just insert and create it. If it does exist, then it will update it. So upsert is really nice to make it simpler to merge incoming data into existing tables without having to worry about well, does it exist or does it not exist? It just handles that for me. And the script activity lets me basically execute custom SQL scripts. So as part of my data workflow, if I do need a more advanced capability, well, I can call a SQL script as part of that to do whatever logic I need within there. Also now, Azure Data Factory to Postgres SQL now supports managed identity authentication. So we're, now we're thinking of, okay, well, it's those data pipelines and it's performing some activity against PostgreSQL, I can use managed identities. So I don't have to handle some secret or other thing. I can just use the identity of my Azure Data Factory so it has a built-in identity or I can use user signed and I would give it permissions to my PostgreSQL database and it's then just gonna use that built-in identity to authenticate and make those updates. 
PostgreSQL 17 PG cron extension has gone GA. So the PG cron extension in PostgreSQL 17 is basically giving you a native job scheduling capability within the PostgreSQL database. As the name suggests, it's using the same syntax as the regular cron scheduler. So super friendly and intuitive. Um, but I can now leverage that directly within the database. Also, uh, PostgreSQL now can use the premium SSD v2. Remember, the premium SSD v2s are more like the ultra disk. I have dynamic IOPS and throughput. So dynamic, I can change them at any time. And they're separate from the capacity and it's sub millisecond latency. So now I can use those disks as part of my PostgreSQL high availability deployment. And MySQL Flexible, um, for its high availability, can now integrate with the standard Azure Load Balancer in preview. So when I think of high availability, I can have a standby replica provisioned. And what it now lets me do is, for those incoming data flows, it goes via the Azure Load Balancer to then send it to whatever the active instance is at that point. So it's gonna help have a more optimized data path. It's gonna make it simpler. It's gonna make it uh, more performant. So that now is available in preview. And MySQL Functions bindings has gone GA. So remember Azure Functions is really event driven. So something happens, it triggers the function, and it's serverless. I pay for the execution, so it executes some code. Now, bindings makes it very easy for that code I'm writing to work with a, a certain set of resources. So in the MySQL case, bindings lets me very simply perform input and output from MySQL. No, this is not triggering. I'm triggering, which lets me actually go and do that event-driven activity for my Azure function, so we actually go and kick it off. So triggering is in preview still for my SQL, but only for dedicated and premium plans. So this GA is only binding. So something has already triggered it, and that wants to go and talk to the my SQL. On the miscellaneous, so Azure Site Recovery, that replication technology that's native to Azure, now supports premium SSD v2. So that's in preview, but if I wanna do AZ to AZ or to another region, I now support those premium SSD v2 disks. Azure Migrate now has zone redundant storage support in preview. So this basically enables me when Azure Migrate is assessing my workloads and deciding on what that target environment looks like, it can migrate to ZRS disks. So that would give me the three copies of my data would now be distributed over the three availability zones that exist in that specific region. Uh, Microsoft and CrowdStrike um, now have this agreement around the threat actor naming. So different entities use different naming for the threat actors, but they've basically made a table available that maps the various names used. So that's gonna enable you as a customer to better correlate. If I quickly actually jump over to that. So if we go and look super quick. So Microsoft, um, they use themes of weather for their naming. And then there's certain nation states and the different countries have a certain family name. And then there's obviously variations of that. But what it's now showing you is based on the threat actor name that Microsoft is using, it's gonna show you other names. So that's gonna better enable you to, hey, I'm using some other system, for example, here, CrowdStrike, and it's gonna make it easy to map the various names to what Microsoft are referring to and to what CrowdStrike's referring to. And the other thing here is as well is I can download that, that table, that mapping as JSON, I can get it through KQL, I can get it through XLS files as well. Um, AI Managed Network has made a, a role-based access control change in GA. So if you think of an Azure Machine Learning Workspace or an AI Foundry Hub with a managed network, what I now have to do is ensure the managed identity that is used by these resources has a specific network connection approver or a custom role that allows private endpoint connections. 
Because basically now, if I want to enable a private endpoint, it used to just do it automatically. But that's considered a security concern. So now you have to specifically grant the associated identity that permission so it can now go and enable those private endpoints. If you have existing private endpoints, they are not impacted. And then the final thing is Azure quota groups have gone GA. Now this is for enterprise agreement customers. And what it lets me now do is share quota over multiple subscriptions. So think of it this way. So I can cre create a quota group arm object, so a control plane object. Now this quota group lives under a specific management group. And what I can now do is once I have that quota group that owns certain amounts of quota, any subscriptions that are part of that quota group, so I add them into that quota group, they can now go and request quota from the quota group, and I can add and remove subscriptions from that quota group whenever I want. So the benefit here is, think if I now have a pool of quota at a higher level than the subscription, and the subscriptions can now self-serve. It's not raising a support ticket, it's not escalating to Microsoft. Subscriptions can transfer their unused quota into that quota group, and I can also go and ask for an additional quota for the quota group. Now, this is only today for IaaS compute resources, and a subscription can only belong to a single quota group. But in that IaaS world, it makes it now a lot simpler to go and get quotas for the various subscriptions. And uh, that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.